for Thursday, May 14th, and thank you for joining us. Um, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, so please refrain from asking any personally identifying health questions. Sorry, a little technical problem there. So if you'd like to ask a question during this chat, please click the Q&A button in, from the Zoom application. You may also raise your hand through Zoom or press star nine from the telephone if you're calling in with us today. So today we have our public health director, Julie Fetterman, joining us. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, before we launch into Q&A from the attendees and some other questions that we've had sent in to us, do either of you have updates? Sure, so I have a, a couple things. So um, <clears throat> it's not COVID related, so that might be a little bit different. Um, on Monday, there was a meeting of the uh, um, town, town council, the school committee and the board of library trustees where we talked about a little more um, specific about the challenges that we have in terms going forward for FY20 and FY21 for the budget. Um, and then the next day on Tuesday, we met with the Finance Committee and got even more specific with actual numbers. Um, so I just want to let people know that, you know, for FY20, when we do our projections, our revenues will be lower, but we've um, reined in our expenses, um, our ongoing expenses. We've had additional COVID-related expenses, but all those things, when you get to the bottom line, we're going to be fine for FY20. So we're confident moving forward on that. Um, for FY21, it will be a bigger challenge. And so the ways that we will meet this significant challenge in our budget <clears throat> is by, and this is a proposal we've made to the finance committee of the town council, is that the three entities would be level funded, not level service budgets, but they would be level funded, meaning that uh, they every the towns, the two the schools, the regional schools and the library would receive roughly the same amount of money for FY21 that we had in FY20. The second piece we would um, have to reduce is our commitment to OPED, which is other post-employment benefits, which is something we've been putting away to pay for future liabilities that we have as a town. It's been a really important contribution, but it's something that if we don't do it this year, we'll survive. Uh, and then the third thing is a significant reduction in our commitment to capital. Um, the, the, cap, the things that we do every day, like buying trucks and ambulances and, and police cars and stuff like that. Uh, we're gonna hold off on making any of those kinds of investments at this moment in time until we see later in the year um, what, what our cash situation looks like. Um, so these are things that, that can be put off. If there's something that can't be put off, we will be presenting that to the town council for funding. Um, but you know, it, 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 the, one of the benefits of a council form of government is that we can bring something back to it in relatively short term. So that's where we are with the budget. It's not a, a pretty picture, but we are fortunate that the town has for years managed its resources well, and we have good reserves and we will be utilizing those reserves. The one caveat on this is we don't know what's going to happen with state aid. And the intent is that if state aid is reduced, we would use our reserves for the, to offset the loss in state aid. Otherwise we will be trimming our budgets in order to stay within the constraints of our reduced uh, revenue coming in. So th that's the big news from my seat. And um, we're really fortunate that we have um, Sean Mangano, who is our new finance director and working with Sonia Aldridge, who's been our interim finance director and comptroller. And so we're gonna need all brains on deck to get through this period. So we've got really good people working on it and it's gonna, we'll get through it. So that's why I have to add Brianna. And so folks who are interested in following along through that budget process um, as documents become available and plans become available, we, we will be putting those online at amherstma.gov slash budget. Um, there's the most recent documents are up there now and we'll continue to add to that as we move forward. Julie, do you have any general updates for us before we launch into some questions? Sure, thank you, Brianna. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I thought I'd talk about contact tracing a little bit. You're all hearing about this concept. Um, this is something that public health departments have always done for diseases. Um, but of course, during this pandemic, uh, contact tracing is being identified as absolutely crucial. So the state has ramped up a program 
to help um, communities with their contact tracing. We have been very lucky. We have Jennifer Brown, our public health nurse, working on contact tracing in Amherst. And we also have two school nurses who have been working on contact tracing also um, during this school year when they're not uh, staffing health rooms. And so we are so grateful to all three of them um, and especially the nurses who are um, you know, stepping up to take this on. So we've had really great um, response with contact tracing. When we call people up, we're getting, um, we're able to reach them, we're able to talk with them. Um, contact tracing is, is I, I guess I should explain again what that is, is so when we're notified um, confidentially when there's a positive case of COVID-19 in Amherst, um, as soon as that happens, one of the nurses calls that case, makes sure that they've got all the care that they need, that they're um, connected with the resources they need and that they understand remaining in isolation. Um, over time, that, that patient is checked in with during the whole time they're in isolation to make sure they continue to be okay and to recover and to get the services that they need. The other piece of that is at that initial phone call, any contacts of that person and a contact, the, the, the definition of that has changed at various times. So um, at this point, it's anyone that they had come in contact with for 48 hours before becoming um, symptomatic. And so those contacts are called up and told that they've come in contact with someone who has COVID-19. It's all confidential. They're not told who they've come in contact, but just that they have come in contact with someone and then quarantine is explained to them. And again, people are monitored during quarantine uh, because the purpose of quarantine, those 14 days when people are to stay at home in their own rooms is to see if the disease develops. Now, of course, there are many things that are difficult about quarantine, but one of them is that often people feel fine, but we are finding around the country that it can sometimes be day seven, day 11, when people start to develop symptoms. Um, if a person develops symptoms, then they get tested. Um, if they do not develop any symptoms and they go through their 14 weeks of quarantine, they're able, they're released from quarantine and they are able to go about their usual business. Um, in the event that Amherst or any other community in Massachusetts, get, Massachusetts gets overwhelmed with the number of contacts to be followed up with, the state has created a contact tracing program in partnership with Partners in Health. So that, sim that um, system has been ramping up for weeks now um, and is now fully in place so that there is this capability for cases to be handled by this statewide uh, group of contact tracers, a hundred, a thousand people in all, many of whom speak different languages um, and can help our community and other communities with contact tracing. So I thought it might be of, of interest to people to understand how that's rolling out in Amherst and in the state. And answer your cell phones, right? Yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you, Diana. So the other piece of this is that um, you should always answer your phone. And if you get a phone call from an 800 number, a lot of us ignore those. Don't ignore it because the contact tracers that are not in our town are using an 800 number to reach out to people. And so answer the call and also know that this is a completely confidential phone call. It's all about just limiting this disease and also helping you with your health because it's crucial for you to know if you've come in contact with someone and potentially been exposed um, because then you will be monitoring your own health closely and then you'll have the guidance of a contact tracer also to help you with that. So answer the call. Thank you. But, if, but no contact tracer will ever ask you for your social security number or Correct. information like that, right? You'll be asked for your health insurance or your social security number. You'll be asked for your date of birth, and that's only because they want to make sure they've got the right person. So your name and your date of birth. Any other of your private information is not necessary um, and won't be asked for. Great. Thank you for that important update. 
and reminder. Um, so I just want to say again to our folks who are on the call live, I see a number of you. Um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A button or simply raise your hand from Zoom and we will um, unmute you and pull you into the room to ask your question. So until then, I have a question here that involves maybe both of you. Um, when do you think businesses will be allowed to reopen, um, not just essential businesses, businesses like bookstores, coffee shops, barber shops, et cetera? And who mm -hmm. gets to decide that? So um, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a question uh, um, we're all wondering about. Right now, those businesses are closed um, at the level, at the governor's level. Uh, he has issued orders that only essential businesses should be open. They are reviewing that. They have a reopening commission that has been set up. Um, I've been on a committee that's been advising that committee, that commission uh, from the municipal level, what it looks like on the, on the ground in, in, at cities and towns. Um, the May 18th is when his order is, the governor's order is supposed to um, expire. And I do not anticipate that he's going to, um, I, I think that he will extend that order. I don't think he's going to just say on May 18th, everything's open. There's no evidence, no scientific support for making that kind of determination. Um, he may continue, I don't know, it's all speculation. Um, it's, but at this level, it's the governor who makes the general call. And it's actually something I've been advocating for and my uh, fellow uh, municipal officials have been advocating that we do this on a state level, not on a city or individual city or town level, uh, because it can be create chaos if one place opens, you know, bookstores or barbershops and the next town doesn't. Uh, you want to do this on a state by state basis. And that's the best metric, that's the best level to be making the decisions. There's a lot of complexities in this. You know, you, you may have seen last week when the governor came out and said golf courses can open uh, in time for Mother's Day and um, many golf courses did open. And so, and, but there were a lot of rules that went along with it. So I think you'll see a, a gradual, you know, they talk about the dial, a gradual opening of things. Um, beyond essential services, but there's so many um, things that have to be taken into consideration. I think it's going to be a slow process. Your thoughts on that, Julie? I would concur with that. I think it's going to be a, a slow process. I think that Massachusetts is learning from what's been happening in other states. And I think the governor is very tuned in with his public health experts and scientists, and it will be a very slow opening um, I know we all know how much everyone wants to get back to work and needs to get back to work. And um, I think that we're lucky that the governor is, is balancing that also with everyone's health, because if we saw a slip back and cases began to rise, um, that would not be a good thing. So um, I agree that I think on Monday, we're going to hear about what comes next, um, but not that things are opening right away. This is semi-related. Um, this person hears that the farmer's market, Amherst Farmer's Market is going to open. Um, they wonder if you think this is safe and um, what might it look like? Will it be different than it was in the past? So we've been working with the farmer's market uh, to see if they can open for, as a good place to buy food, not as a social gathering place. That's an important change. There will not be music there. Uh, it will not be a place to bring your dog and walk it through the market, and anything like that. It's, it will be an outdoor place to purchase food. Um, and in order to do that, um, we are, we've looked at two different locations and the farmer's market would like to relocate the farmer's market to the town common. Um, and that's what will be presented to the town council uh, on Monday uh, for their consideration. And if it opens and that, there's a lot more space in the town council and in, in the town in the town common and that allows them to really space out things and to control traffic flow um, there's a lot of um, requirements that will be put in place for them and including uh, and julie has been looking at a lot of these things and she may add more as, as we start to you know experience it on the ground but there you will have to wash your hands before you you enter the farmer's market um, you will be required to wear a mask when you are working there or entering or, or going through the farmer's market. They'll be socially distanced all throughout the farmer's market. So I think the um, town council is 
eager to have the farmer's market open as a place to buy food outside, um, but um, it has to be done with, with certain precautions. And Julie, on that. Yeah, um, Inspection Services has been working really hard on this, trying to figure out a way to set up that would be um, preserving the social distancing and keeping people safe. Notoriously, this has been um, a place to get food, but also a very social event. So, you know, setting up, setting it up physically so that it's not social, um, you know, sadly is what we need to do now. And um, the uh, building commissioner and, and the inspectors have been working really hard on ways to create a system that will allow people to flow through safely and to purchase food. Um, I think it's also a change of mindset for the community that we're looking at. This is another place to get food. Um, we all know it's been tough in grocery stores. Um, sometimes you're not finding what you want to get. We also want to be able to support our farmers and eat mm -hmm. local food. So this is a great opportunity to do this. The state is all behind farmers markets being open. Um, and so we're going to be looking for the public to help us with this, um, to make it a safe place for everyone to go and, to, um, and for this to work well. It'll be a partnership. So we, we got a couple um, of follow-up questions that came in from some of our attendees here. Can businesses submit proposals for safely opening, perhaps partly by limiting services? So, so businesses, uh, if, if it's a restaurant or something like that, they are permitted to do curbside takeout type of business. So there are certain rules that are for certain businesses, but only if they're defined as, as an essential operation, Julie. I think that's right, isn't that, Julie? Correct, yeah. At this time, um, I know a lot of businesses are thinking about when the governor starts turning that dial and opening things up, how could their business be able to open in a way that's safe? And until we get the guidance from the governor, th there's nothing that, that we can really do locally about that. Definitely food service has been able to continue with um, takeout and curbside pickup. Um, but at this moment, um, nothing has really changed from the past several weeks around what businesses can do other than, as Paul said, um, the, uh, the golf courses. So again, we're waiting for the governor's guidance on what comes next and um, then we'll be implementing in, in Amherst how that can move forward. And one more follow-up on the contact tracing. The, um, Sarah wants to know, will the contact tracers leave a message? Ah, uh, yes, thank you. That came up last week. Um, no, they'll be calling back to help preserve confidentiality. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So some new folks are in the room, feel free to use Q&A or raise your hand, star nine from the phone to ask your question. Another question we have here is, do either of you have an opinion as to whether the colleges and universities should reopen in the fall physically? Oh, I was hoping you say will, that's, that's it, should is a different question. Mm -hmm. um, will uh, and should. <laughs> will and should. Um, Will they open it? Well, we know Amherst, uh, Hampshire College has said that if the state allows it and the federal government allows it, they will open in the fall. They believe that they can accommodate the social distancing and the, and the uh, uh, housing and uh, teaching and learning environments successfully. Um, we have not heard from Amherst or UMass, and I don't think they, uh, I, I, you know, we're, we're, we're all eager to hear what they have to say. Um, and so it's a total speculation on whether they will or not. I know they have a lot of things to consider because this, you're bringing lots of people into a, a campuses from all over the world and whether they, that's a good idea or not. Should they? That's above my pay grade. Maybe it goes to Julie. <laughs> <laughs> a raise in my future. Um, yeah, I think this is something, you know, we're, we're confronting all over the country. Um, you know, this balance between wanting education to continue, but what will it look like? How will it be safe? Um, I think uh, it's above my pay grade and uh, we've got a lot of great minds thinking about this on the state level with our state university and Amherst College and Hampshire College have been so thoughtful in their, their approach to this pandemic and how they've been so proactive in protecting faculty and staff as has, as has the university. So um, I think I, 
I trust that um, good decisions will be made and they're tough ones to make. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do we want to talk about face masks again? I know we, we've got an initiative going on for the community, but do we want to share any just refreshers on where we are with face coverings and face masks right now in terms sure. of requirements? Yeah, it, it's, it tends, to, it, it's always complicated for folks. I think um, I'm going to reiterate a little bit what I said last week, which is that, um, I think I said it last week, <laughs> I said it somewhere. Um, when you go out the door, have a mask with you. Um, you know, you might be going for a walk around the neighborhood and think you're not going to run into one, anyone, but then suddenly there might be like a group and it's a little hard to get past. So you want to be able to have a mask on um, in case you're interacting with people. Um, you know, if you're basically just walking past someone and it's, you know, one minute, 30 seconds, you know, you're not, the chances of you you know, becoming in contact with the disease are very slim, but it's also partly about making other folks feel comfortable because they don't know. And so it's also a courtesy to just have a mask on if you're coming within six feet of folks. Um, and really what you have to do is, you know, even if you're going out in your car or whatever, just have one with you, um, have it in your pocket. I guess we all gotta have pockets now. Um, keep one in your car. Um, and just have it with you um, in case you're going to stop somewhere, in case you're going to do something. Um, make sure that your mask uh, fits tightly around your cheeks uh, because the purpose of the mask is, and across your nose. So some, some people have the blue paper masks that have a little bit of metal up here. You want to really shape that to your nose. Make sure the whole thing is fitting smoothly. Um, if you have a cloth mask or a bandana, again, you want it to really be sort of tied up against your skin, um, but you still want to be able to breathe comfortably. Um, I've talked before about the right kind of fabrics. Um, you want a tightly woven cotton, like um, a quilting fabric or a batik. Here we go. I've even got one right here like this. Um, and you want to have more than one layer. And what they're finding is layers of two different fabrics that are very um, tightly woven, like flannel and quilt quilting cotton together, um, create a great barrier. And there's some research to show that there's a little bit of static electricity that's happening between the fabrics that also might be helpful. Um, the other thing to remember is that when you take your mask off, um, you want to remove it from your ears and try not to touch the front of it because there could be virus on that. And when you've got a cloth mask, just when you get home, just what I do, I go right to the bathroom sink, goes in the bathroom sink. I keep a little soap in there. I wash it out, hang it up to dry. Um, so really the best thing is for, if everyone can have two cloth masks, um, then you're kind of good to go. One's always drying, one is ready. Um, and, um, what else was I going to say about that? So we're not recommending masks, as you've heard, for children under the age of two. Um, also, the uh, Commissioner of Public Health put out an advisory saying that also we know that there are people who cannot wear a mask for various reasons um, because of their um, inability to be covered up like that it can affect their breathing. So recognize that if you see someone without a mask, you don't know why they're not wearing a mask. You know, we're not looking for people to try to enforce this, um, this on others. Um, people, some people just can't wear a mask. Um, and we're hoping that everyone who can will wear one. You are required to wear one if you are going into um, an indoor space, a store, um, uh, an office building. Um, so it's it's a it's a real adjustment, I think, for everyone to get used to this. Um, and as as uh, Brianna was mentioning, the town does have a mask program. We're still looking for donations of fabric, and we're really looking and other materials. I think maybe like elastic. Also, we're also looking for sewers, uh, because the idea is to get masks out to people who don't have the ability to get their own homemade homemade masks or to make them. And so we're really um, trying to make that happen and um, looking for more volunteers and supplies. And I don't know if you wanna say more about that, Brianna. 
Yeah, and I just want to say quickly thank you to all of the people who have donated already, whether it was through materials, funds, um, or actually sewing. We were able to get um, a couple hundred masks out to people who have requested, and um, we're trying to put them in the, the lending libraries and uh, working with the school to maybe put them out through the lunch distribution. So that is hundreds and hundreds of more masks. So. Um, anybody who can volunteer time materials, if they could um, call the town manager's office at 413-259-3002 or visit us online um, on the community participation website. That's amherstma.gov slash get involved. So anything that you can do um, or share this with someone who, who you know might be interested, that would be very helpful. Yeah, it's been amazing the, the amount of interest with people responding to offer services, but overwhelming response to people saying, yes, my family needs masks and where do I, and we can't get them online. We can't find them. This is a godsend. Um, one of our CPOs had someone in tears thanking her for the masks uh, because of her family situation. She can't leave the house um, and um, easily. And so she was really hopeful, hoping for a mask. So, but we have way more requests for masks than we have masks available, even though in we produce over 200 within a few days. So it's really a great outpouring, but we need a lot more. Absolutely. All right. Um, I, ha I have another question here. And again, I'll remind the folks in the room, we're coming up to the end of our time. So if you have anything you wanna pop into the question box, please do that. Um, I have a question is, let's see, when will town hall in the senior center open to the public again? So um, the town hall, we will open to the, our first order of business is to figure out how to bring employees back safely. And, and that is a pretty large task because we know that people gathering in a space over time is a bad thing to do at this moment in time. So that's why we're not, we're not interested in doing that. Um, we do have a team, a, a team of employees who are working on our reopening plan for our bringing our employees back. And then the next phase will be, how do we open the building to the public? That's a second phase. First thing is to, if we, how do we bring our employees back safely? The second is um, opening the building to the public. We're able to really meet the needs of the public and pretty successfully. Um, we have staff who will meet you in the back of the of into the, in the parking lot if you are looking for your marriage certificates or something like that. It's, it's, it's being worked out and people have been very creative about it. Um, the senior center, I would not anticipate that opening this calendar year at all. We will not be looking for um, creating a space where the most, one of the most vulnerable populations can gather. Um, and, you know, again, we will lead all of our, follow our advice of our, of our health and our scientists, you know, like Julie, and we'll, she will guide us on these decisions. But my speculation is that I don't anticipate the senior center opening this calendar year. Julie, okay. do you? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, I, because our seniors are just so vulnerable to this illness, um, I think the idea of bringing people in to a building um, won't be wise until we have a vaccine or, mm -hmm. or something else changes in this picture of the disease. Um, we have a wonderful senior center director, Mary Beth Ogilevitz, who's um, doing all kinds of remote programming and um, so I think that uh, there will just be more and more attempts to be decentralizing services, bringing services to people, bringing classes into their homes. Um, it's, uh, and you know, the benefit of that is there've also been lots of people who couldn't make it to the senior center. So um, yeah, there'll be silver linings there also. Mm -hmm. And the food program is still continuing. Um, people are getting meals delivered. Uh, so, the fact that there's not a congregate place for a meal um, has not interrupted people receiving meals. Great, thank you. So we are, we're coming close to our, our 12.30 timeline. Do either of you have any uh, last words for our viewers today? Just thank you for tuning in and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. And thank you all for what you're doing with social distancing and wearing masks and staying home. Um, you know, it, Amherst has done a really good job of protecting each other. 
and I know how hard this is. I have been in my house for a very long time <laughs> and uh, it's tough, it's tough. And so we really appreciate, um, you know, the community because you're doing it for yourself and you're doing it for others and it's so appreciated. Great, okay, well, Thank you, everybody. If you have follow-up questions, please email us at info at amherstma.gov or contact the town manager's office. The number again is 259-3002. We appreciate you all for joining us. Stay safe and have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you both. Bye.